Today's incident will wake up your soul. Please watch the incident till the end. Assalamu alaikum friends. Friends, this incident is a true incident. The incident happened in the city of Pakistan. Suddenly in the grave of this beautiful girl, what was seen, there is a lesson in this incident for every mother and sister, which will make you cry after hearing. So know the whole incident. Don't drag the video to watch till the end. So let's start. The beautiful woman of Pakistan dies. After the funeral, when her body is lowered from the bed to be buried, it is seen in the grave, a terrible, poisonous snake. This snake is poisonous. Everyone present was frightened, they were terrified. A second grave was dug for the beautiful woman. Until the moment before the body was lowered into the grave, this second grave was empty. No snake or any other animal was there. But whenever her body was placed in the grave, then it was seen that the snake was in the first grave. Then the third grave was dug. When the body was placed, the snake was visible in the first grave. Everyone said that according to the situation, no matter how many graves are dug for this body, all the grave snakes will come. So let the dead body be buried in this grave to be kept in the grave. And when it was brought down from the bed, the snake went to one side of the grave and made room for the dead body. But when the body was placed, immediately the snake, removing the cloth from the face of the body, twisted its tongue. Everyone present at this scene once again became disturbed. Everyone began to wonder, what is the matter? Why is this happening? Burial of the body. Among the people who came, the husband of the beautiful woman was also asked, what is the cause of this torment on your wife? You can tell. He said, my wife used to treat me badly, did me many wrongs, hurt me in many ways, but I used to be patient, never retaliated or retaliated. Instead of his bad words and sad behavior, I didn't say anything to him. People started talking about my husband. Yes, brother, we understand to trouble you, this plight of your wife. Please forgive her now, ask forgiveness for her. Then the husband of the beautiful woman raised his hand in the court of Allah Almighty. And the husband said, O oh Allah, I have forgiven my wife, so please forgive her too and save her from all the torments of the grave. As soon as the prayer was over, the terrible snake appeared, disappeared in an instant, and all the trouble was removed. And they heaved a sigh of relief. Dear mothers and sisters, you who torment your husbands, slander them and say whatever comes to your mouth. Take a lesson from this video today. Friends, share the story. A renowned scholar of India, Hazrat Malana Mufti Mahmud Hassan, Gangani Ramatullahi. Another surprising thing happened, dear friends. This is a true incident. The incident happened in an area near Medina. A woman died. Another woman started bathing her. The woman who was giving her bath when her hand was on the dead woman. On reaching Uru, he said to two four of the women who were around him, Oh my sisters, this woman who died today had illicit relations with many men. But she couldn't move the hand, if she insisted more, the thigh started moving along with the hand, thus the time passed. The relatives of the dead woman started saying, Finish the bath quickly, it's evening, finish the funeral, we have to bury. Then the woman said, I want to release your dead woman, but she doesn't want to release me. She held my hand on her thigh, thus the night passed. Her hand also stuck on her thigh, morning came, but it remained the same. Then the problem. Seeing the complex, the family members of the dead woman went to Ulama Ekram and one of the scholars said, Malvi Sahib, a woman was giving bath to another woman. When her hand stuck to the thigh of the dead woman, what can be done now? He gave a fatwa, cut off the hand of the living woman with a knife. Then the relatives of the woman giving the bath said, we do not want to make the woman defective, we will not allow her hand to be cut off. Then everyone went to another cleric, he was all something said. He also said, separate the flesh of the dead woman with a knife. Then the relatives of the dead woman said, we do not want to make our dead bad. Three days and three nights passed like this, it was very hot. The heat of the sun took a terrible shape. As a result, the stench started spreading. The news spread in all the surrounding areas. Everyone thought that, now so there is no solution, let's go to Medina. There Imam Malik, Ramatullahi alayhi, was engaged in the main work. People went to Imam Malik, Ramatullahi alayhi, and said, Huzur is a woman. Another woman was being bathed. Then her hand was stuck to the thigh of the dead woman. There was no way to move it. It has been three days. Now will you give a fatwa? Take me there. 
he went there and stood inside the curtain covered with a sheet. Said to the bath lady, when this woman was to be bathed, your hand was stuck. You did not say anything. Then the woman said, I only said that this woman who died had illicit relations with many men. Then Imam Malik Ramatullahi, Alaihi said, Did you see with your own eyes the slander that you slandered? And do you have four witnesses for it? The woman then said, No, Imam Malik Ramatullahi, Alaihi said, The woman acknowledged the sin in front of you. The woman then said, No, then why did you slander that woman? And hearing that, the woman giving bath said, That is why I said I saw the dead woman carrying a pitcher passing in front of the door of the people's house. Hearing this, the Imam Malik Ramatullahi Alaihi standing there. He looked at the entire Quran and said, The Quran has come in, let us flog those who slander Sati Savitri women twice. Surah Noor verse 4, Since you slandered a dead woman without proof, the executioner began to flog her. Then the executioner began to beat her. 79. Even after the flogging his hands remained as before, and finally when the eighty lashes were completed his knees were already separated. Subhanallah. Have you ever wondered why Salah holds such a profound place in the life of a Muslim? Salah, or prayer, is more than a mere act of worship. It's a cornerstone of Islam, one of the five pillars upon which the faith is built. At its heart, Salah is a profound conversation with Allah, a direct line of communication that allows Muslims to seek guidance, ask for assistance, and express their gratitude. But this spiritual dialogue extends beyond the words spoken. It's a holistic practice that encompasses the mind, body, and soul, fostering a deep sense of inner peace and discipline. It's through Salah that Muslims are able to cultivate spiritual growth, fortifying their connection to Allah and deepening their understanding of their faith. The beauty of Salah lies not only in its ritual but also in its impact. It's a compass that guides Muslims through life's challenges and a beacon that illuminates the path to spiritual enlightenment. As we can see, Salah plays a pivotal role in strengthening a Muslim's relationship with Allah. So, what happens when we commit sins and do not seek forgiveness? In Islam, sin is seen as a transgression against divine law, a deviation from the path that Allah has set for us. Its impact on a believer's spiritual journey can be profound. Every sin, big or small, creates a barrier between the believer and Allah, causing a spiritual disconnect that can reverberate through one's life. The consequences of sins are manifold. One of the most serious implications is the potential for Salah or prayer to be rejected. Salah is a cornerstone of Islamic faith, a direct line of communication with Allah. But when we sin and do not seek forgiveness, it's like we're dialing the number, but the call isn't going through. We're trying to connect, but the line is busy with our transgressions. But here's the thing about Islam and sin. It's never too late to seek forgiveness and repent. Repentance is not a one and done deal. It's an ongoing process, a continuous cycle of self-reflection, acknowledgement of our wrongdoings, and sincere pleas for mercy and forgiveness. It's about course correction, about getting back on the path that Allah has set for us. Sin may soil our souls, but repentance is the cleansing agent, the spiritual detergent that removes the stains and restores the purity of our hearts. It's a way to bridge the gap that sin creates, to re-establish that vital connection with Allah. Indeed, sins can cloud our hearts and distance us from our Creator, but Allah's mercy is boundless for those who seek it. So how can we ensure our Salah is accepted and our sins are forgiven? The answer lies in consistency and sincerity. Performing Salah regularly is not just a ritual, but a direct link to Allah. It's a time to pause, reflect, and connect with our Creator. Each word uttered, each posture assumed, holds deep significance and benefits. But without sincerity, the physical acts are meaningless. So when you stand for Salah, let your heart stand with you. Let it be filled with humility, gratitude and an earnest desire to please Allah. Slipping into sins is part of being human. But remember, Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. When we falter, let's not despair, for Allah's mercy encompasses all things. Instead, let's turn back to Him in repentance, promising to avoid that sin in the future. Finally, let's strive for continuous self-improvement and spiritual growth. Islam encourages us to be better today than we were yesterday, and better tomorrow than we are today. It's a journey of perseverance, learning, and growth. Remember, our journey to Allah is one of perseverance and constant striving. May our Salah be a source of comfort and our repentance be accepted. Ameen.
Have you ever wondered how different religions perceive God? The divine, the transcendent, the ultimate reality. These are just a few of the terms used to describe the concept that many of us know as God. Across the globe and throughout history, humanity has grappled with profound questions about this entity. Questions like, what is the nature of God? Is there one God or many? Is God personal or impersonal? These questions touch upon our deepest yearnings, our fears, our hopes, and our very understanding of existence itself. In our quest for answers, we turn to diverse religious traditions, each offering their unique perspectives on the divine. Christianity speaks of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while Hinduism presents a pantheon of deities, each embodying different aspects of the divine. Buddhism, on the other hand, does not focus on a creator God, but rather on achieving enlightenment and escaping the cycle of rebirth. Yet today, our focus shifts to a religion that makes a firm and unequivocal proclamation. There is only one God, indivisible and without equal. This is the faith of Islam, and the God it worships is Allah. You may have heard the name Allah before, but what does it truly mean? Who is Allah in the context of Islamic belief? And how does this understanding differ from other religious perspectives? Is Allah just another name for God or does it represent a fundamentally different concept? These questions and more will guide our journey as we explore the Islamic conception of Allah. We will delve into the Quran, the holy book of Islam, to uncover how it portrays this single all-powerful deity. We will grapple with complex theological ideas and seek to understand how Muslims relate to Allah in their daily lives. So, fasten your seatbelts and prepare for a fascinating exploration that promises to challenge your preconceptions, broaden your horizons, and deepen your understanding of the divine. Closing Stay with us as we delve into the intricate concept of Allah in Islam. To comprehend Allah, we must first understand the fundamental beliefs of Islam. Islam is grounded in a few basic tenets that mold the understanding of Allah. The first and foremost is the belief in Tawheed, which is the oneness of God. This concept is so central to Islam that it is encapsulated in the declaration of faith known as the Shahada, which states, there is no deity except Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This declaration signifies that there is only one divine entity, Allah, who is supreme, eternal and transcendent. Another key belief is in the divine revelations, the most significant of which is the Quran. Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of Allah, revealed to Prophet Muhammad over a span of 23 years. The Quran is viewed as a guide for life, containing wisdom and teachings that shape the moral and ethical framework of a Muslim. It is through the Quran that Muslims gain a deeper understanding of Allah's nature and attributes. Next, we have the belief in the afterlife and the day of judgment. Muslims believe that life on earth is a test and our actions will be judged by Allah on the day of judgment. This belief in accountability underscores the importance of living a virtuous life and fosters a sense of responsibility towards our actions. Lastly, there's a belief in the divine decree or qada. This is the belief that everything that happens in the universe happens according to Allah's plan. It's an acknowledgement of Allah's complete sovereignty and control over all things. These beliefs shape the Islamic understanding of Allah. They present Allah as a singular supreme entity, the author of the Quran, the judge of all actions and the planner of all events. They emphasize Allah's uniqueness, his omnipotence and his omniscience. They cultivate a sense of awe, reverence and love for Allah. With this foundation we can begin to explore the multifaceted nature of Allah. Central to the Islamic faith is the belief in Allah as the one and only God. This belief, known as monotheism, is not just a religious doctrine, but also a profound philosophical concept that has shaped Islamic thought and culture for over 14 centuries. It's a notion that reverberates through every aspect of a Muslim's life, shaping their understanding of the universe, humanity, and their personal relationship with the divine. In the Islamic paradigm, Allah is not one among many gods, but the sole creator and sustainer of all existence. There is no pantheon of deities, no divine council, and no demigods or semi-divine beings. There is only Allah, the absolute, the eternal, the incomparable. This resolute monotheism is encapsulated in the Islamic creed, the Shahada, which states, there is no God but Allah. 
This is a sharp contrast to the polytheistic beliefs found in some other religions, where multiple gods and goddesses coexist, each responsible for different aspects of the world. In these religious systems, the divine is fragmented, divided into multiple entities with limited scope and power. But in Islam, all power and authority, all wisdom and mercy, converge in Allah. Allah is not a part of creation, nor is creation a part of Allah. Allah is distinct from creation, yet intimately connected to it. Allah is the source of all life, the giver of all blessings, the judge of all deeds. And while Allah is beyond human comprehension, Muslims believe that they can know Allah through his attributes and actions, as revealed in the Quran. This monotheistic belief, this notion of a singular, all-encompassing deity, is not only foundational to Islam, but also shapes the Muslims' worldview and their relationship with the divine, with the world, and with themselves. It fosters a sense of unity, of interconnectedness, of purpose and meaning. In the grand tapestry of existence, everything, from the most distant star to the smallest atom, is interconnected, interdependent, part of a harmonious whole. And at the heart of this cosmic symphony, orchestrating every note, is Allah, the one, the unique, the incomparable. This belief in a single divine entity sets the stage for the unique attributes of Allah. Allah is not just a singular entity, but also a complex character with numerous attributes. Imagine a multifaceted diamond, each facet reflecting a different hue of light, yet the diamond remains one. So too is Allah with his 99 beautiful names, each reflecting a different aspect of his divine essence. But remember these names are not separate entities. They are facets of the one, the singular, indivisible Allah. Take Al-Rahman, the most merciful, for instance. This name conveys the limitless compassion of Allah, his boundless mercy that encompasses all creation. Then we have Al-Malik, the sovereign king. This name speaks to his absolute authority over the universe, his power that prevails over all. Consider Al-Ghafur, the all-forgiving. This attribute underscores Allah's infinite capacity to forgive, speaking volumes about his boundless mercy and benevolence. Then there's Al-Wadud, the loving, which tells us about the profound love Allah has for his creation. These names are not just titles. They offer insight into the nature of Allah, and they also serve as a spiritual guide for Muslims. By understanding these attributes, Muslims strive to embody these qualities in their own lives. For instance, by understanding Al-Rahman, they strive to be merciful to others. By understanding Al-Kafur, they strive to be forgiving. This concept of the divine differs significantly from the depiction of God in other religions. Where some faiths may depict their God as predominantly wrathful or predominantly loving, Islam presents a balanced view of Allah, a deity who is both just and merciful, powerful and loving. Each name, each attribute of Allah is a reminder of his infinite nature, his unparalleled majesty and his boundless love. These attributes are not just names. They are a compass for Muslims, guiding them in their spiritual journey helping them navigate the complexities of life. These attributes offer a deeper understanding of Allah, as well as the profound respect and devotion Muslims have towards Him. We've taken a fascinating journey into the heart of the Islamic faith. We began by probing the divine, exploring the intricacies of understanding God or Allah as perceived in Islam. We delved into the profound depths of monotheism, a key pillar that upholds the Islamic faith. This concept is not just about the belief in one God, but it's also about the unwavering dedication to his oneness in all aspects of life. We then moved on to understanding Allah himself, an entity beyond human comprehension and yet so intimately involved in the lives of the believers. Allah, the Arabic term for God, is not just a name but an embodiment of the ultimate reality. This reality, transcending human understanding, is the force that underlies all existence. We've also explored the concept of Allah as the one and only. The Islamic faith emphasizes the uniqueness of Allah, his singularity in creation and his absolute authority over all that exists. This belief, Tawheed, is a cornerstone of Islam, shaping the spiritual and daily lives of Muslims worldwide. And finally, we delved into the attributes of Allah. Unlike human attributes that are limited and often flawed, the attributes of Allah are perfect and infinite. He is the most merciful, the most wise, the all-knowing, the all-seeing, and the list goes on. Each attribute a testament to his greatness. As we reflect upon this journey, we realize the unique aspects of the Islamic perception of God. It's not merely about acknowledging God's existence, 
but about recognizing his oneness, understanding his attributes, and living a life that echoes this understanding. This exploration is a testament to the depth and richness of the Islamic faith, its principles, and its profound interpretation of the divine. As we conclude, we hope this exploration of Allah in Islam has given you a broader perspective on the diverse ways in which the divine is understood and revered across various cultures and religions.